Hello everyone. Today's video is about the soft systems methodology, also known as the Checklands methodology. This is the workhorse of systems thinking. This is probably the best known methodology or strategy that is being used so many times as an ideal way in order to explain or to put in practice what the system thinking is about. The methodology itself is actually a comparison between what is the ideal and what is the real, what we call the ideal world and the real world. If you want, we all live in a world like this. Every time we're driving a car, the car has a direction. But if the road changes, we adjust the wheel in order to adjust to the new reality we're facing. And in a sense, this is part of what the system methodology does. It determines what is the path that we want to follow and we compare to what we have in reality and adjust in order to improve the direction or the role we're following. Um, let, let, let me start with the presentation, but probably more important will be to explain based on the different uh, system of system methodologies what exactly is that uh, we see or we try to frame the actual use of the checklist methodology. We are already familiar with this concept, with this idea of a number of system thinking strategies. Remember, we refer to these strategies as system methodologies. In particular, the soft system methodology, according to the uh, concept or ideas presented by Professor Jackson on his system of system methodologies, soft system methodology will be somewhere here. In this case, I tend to agree with Professor Jackson, but I would probably be a little bit more generous in the sense that uh, the methodology could be a good idea in order to uncover some of the uncertain elements that surround the organization or the um, a company we are trying to understand or analyze. So this would be the area for the SSM or the soft system methodology. There is a lot of uh, literature about the soft system methodology, uh, different cases where it has been implemented, and some of the benefits that you receive from its actual implementation. Of course, I just have time to have a general overview of the methodology. But uh, in particular, this is a methodology that encompasses, that, that takes a, a number of stages that requires practice. So the fifth of the tutorials will be associated with, the, with using this specific methodology. So let me go through the methodology and, uh, and then you'll have the opportunity to experience once we come back after the Eastern break, which will not be a break, of course, given the present situation we are in. So let me start with the presentation. And over there you have the different stages. The soft system methodology is composed by seven different stages. They are number one to seven. And as you see, there is a difference. There is a line, a distinction between what we call the real world and the systems thinking world. In the real world, we observe the, the world as it is. In the systems world, we try to determine what is ideal. What would be the ideal type of organization? And then by making a comparison between what we got and what it should or ought to be, then we are able to determine uh, paths or actions for improvement. In a sense, this is also how a, a doctor operates. When they receive a patient, all the symptoms that a patient has is part of the real world. So in that sense, as the doctor is getting all that information, he relates all that information with what a healthy patient will be like. And by doing a comparison, he starts to determine or to identify a path so that he determines what the patient is suffering from. And then as he goes ar around time and time again, he gains experience and eventually describes uh, what the illness is, determines what the uh, prescriptions will be like, and what are the actions that the patient needs to go through in order to improve his or health uh, healthy condition. 
So let me start with the different stages. I will I'll be going through each one of them and try to present uh, as much detail as I possibly uh, are allowed to show. The first stage, the problem situation and structure, is basically to recognize we are facing a situation which is not as easy to solve. This is not to say problems are easy to solve, but remember we've been making a distinction between what we call a problem context in an instructor way and a problem. If somebody is suffering from, let's say, a, the typical case uh, that we're facing today, uh, suffering from coronavirus, that person, of course, is or has um, a, a, an illness that is not as easy to be dealt with. We're learning as we're going every, every day, we're advancing and uh, science is uh, trying to get a, a, a cure to that specific illness. But when we don't know what the illness is, this is when we need to increase our level of understanding. We are going through a learning process. So when you are facing a situation in an organization where the problem is clearly determined, for instance, there is a drop in quality and customers are not happy, and you are able to determine that the reduction in quality is associated with the lack of adequate raw materials, then you have a problem. It might not be easy to solve it, but at least you know what the problem is. What we meant by a problem situation that is unstructured, this is when we don't know, we cannot pinpoint what exactly the problem is. There is an interrelation of different problems. Different problems connect, and uh, it is not necessarily uh, easy to determine what is the problem we're facing. Or simply because, although the problem is clear to me, when I ask somebody else what the problem is, he or she has a different idea. There is disagreement about what the problem is. There might be some elements where we agree what the situation is, but we don't necessarily have the same understanding of the problem. And this is associated with the different perspectives we have. And by perspective, I mean sometimes we have different experiences. We've been going through similar processes where we had an experience that take us to conclude we are facing a similar situation, a similar problem, but that might not be necessarily the case. It is only that the situation under study resembles something I lived before, and therefore I came to the conclusion that the problem is exactly the same. It might not be the case. Also, we have values. We have ways to understand things, and those values, experiences, are act like a filter that, uh, that make us or create a sense of bias in the way we determine or identify the problem. The same occurs in terms of the solution. Probably we all agree on what the problem is, but there is disagreement about what is the best course of action. And the checklist methodology or the soft system methodology, guys, is a good way to try to deal with those differences. Remember, at the core of the pluralistic nature of the problem, let me go back to the system of system methodologies, this pluralistic nature assumes that there are differences or uh, there is disagreement between different participants about what the problem is and what the, the best course of action will be. But as it is pluralistic, that means there is room for agreement. We can reach consensus, we can debate, we can have a dialectical debate in order to identify it and to learn from each other, identify what the problem is, but learn from those different perspectives. Of course, if somebody imposes his solution or his definition of the problem, the context is coercive. And when you move into the extreme uh, forms of coercion, this is when the soft system methodology loses effectiveness, according to Professor Jackson's ideas, and also based on the personal experience I have uh, in using the methodology. So back to the presentation, apologies there. So, Move on to the second stage. Under this second stage, we want to express and to explain what the problem is. So far, we know there is a problem, there are different ideas, there are different perspectives, 
And so what we want is to understand what those different visions, what those different understandings, perspectives are. And uh, Peter Checkland recommends the use of um, a graphical tool. Uh, it is based on the idea that uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And although this sounds a bit crazy, uh, I have used this methodology before, and decision makers say, Roberto, what do you want me to do? Do you really mean you want me to, to draw something? This doesn't look very serious to me. However, after these uh, high-ranking officials, important business people, engage in the exercise, there is a learning process. Of course, we are sometimes afraid to draw something because our drawing abilities are zero, non-existent. And so we tend to make a fool out of ourselves. But it is very simple. Try to present in a single piece of paper what your understanding is of the situation under study. There is no wrong or right. All we want to have is your take, your understanding of the problem situation. So you come forward, you present what you've been drawing, what your conclusions are using drawings, and uh, that creates and allows other, others to understand your vision of the problem. So Checkland recommends the use of what he calls a rich picture. And a rich picture is nothing else than a way to explore, acknowledge, or define a situation that we consider problematic. The main idea, remember, is highlighted in the red color in the presentation. The main idea is to open a discussion and uh, those understanding to come to the fore so that we can increase our level of understanding. And this is quite um, practical and quite relevant. When you have different people to come and to explain what is that they see, it will not be as easy if I need to talk what the problem is. Probably I will be concentrated on what it is the most pressing issue to me. But when you, you have to define, when you have to create, to define the problem, creating a draw, you add elements because you want to make yourself better understood by others. And so you keep adding elements and eventually you uh, sudden, well not suddenly, but as a product of the exercise, realize what the problem or other dimensions of the problem. What I have next are some of uh, illustrations that I got about what a rich picture is. In this case, it is uh, a rich picture created by somebody who was explaining what the police uh, statement request process is. And as you can see, there are multiple arrows going back and forth. So in a sense that explains the red tape, the many stages involved in creating a police uh, request uh, statement. Another one is the one that you have on the screen now. It is supposed to be the process of university students going through the process of selecting accommodation. And probably this is something you went through while you were, or when you came first to university, or every year you came to university, you went through that process, that you are inundated with uh, information, you have uh, many things to do, uh, there are many requirements along the process. And at the center, there is a guy crying for help. And probably this is something you went through. So if you go through the process of creating the diagram, explaining what the process of getting accommodation at the university is, you will be able to explain. Actually, you don't even need to explain it. Even if I look at, that, at your drawing, then uh, the duration of the problem context will come clearer to me. There is another diagram there, and uh, I put that one because I want to highlight those swords um, interacting at some point. That means a break of communication. There is a no a clear uh, communication between those two. The communication has been cut, and that's what is meant by those swords in the picture. So if I saw that diagram, I see this person, who
whoever created that uh, diagram is saying or he's explaining or she's explaining that there was a miscommunication between two different agents within the specific company. So what I did, of course, running the risk of uh, you seeing how poor my drawings are, I created a, a diagram, probably it's not as clear, let me make it closer a bit. And this is trying to explain how I feel through this teaching online. This is supposed to be me. Of course, as you can see, uh, probably I'm too generous to myself. So uh, here I am, that's a computer, that's my screen. And according to me, I have four groups of students. A lot of students who are really bored by my explanation, uh, not as many with lots of questions, a couple probably happy students, and one who actually learned something from me. And uh, behind the computer, there is me again, inundated by a number of backlog messages that I need to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm trying to show, I am not saying this is the way it is for me, right? All I'm trying to say is, if I were asked what is teaching online like, probably if I say, this is my understanding of teaching online. Probably I don't need to explain much. Of course, my drawings are really poor, but if somebody is clever enough to understand what I've been trying to explain, probably he'll say, okay, now I got it. This is Roberto's own perspective of what the teaching online is like, how he feels about it. This is not what the way I feel. I have to, make, I have to be clear. This is I'm just trying to explain what a dimension of teaching online could entail having a large audience of students who are really bored by my online teaching, right? So again, this is just a way to express what a problem situation that I'm facing is like. Again, this is not to say this is the truth. What I'm saying is this is the take, this is the understanding of one person of what the situation is like. The third stage is uh, what we call the first of the system world activities. Let me go back to the stages of the SSM. And if, if you look carefully, the first one, the problem situation on struct is just the recognition. They were facing a problem that is not, not as easy to define. The second one is the construction of a rich picture where all those different elements, all those different understandings of what the problem is came to the fore through the use of those different diagrams. If each one of you were asked to create a rich picture of what the education online is like, I'm pretty sure there'll be so many elements coming forward. You'll be talking about some of the problems you are facing. Probably if you're asked, what is the education online like? You will probably say, well, it's, it's, it's all right. But behind the all right thing, there will be so many factors and those factors will not appear unless you are asked to create a document or to do a drawing as I was doing mine. Now, the third stage, root definition of relevant system, as you can see, it is the first activity on the or below this division line between the real world thinking and the system thinking of the systems world. If you want we have the real world and the ideal world down there. So that third activity, it is a stage when we move away from the real world and enter this system thinking idea. Under the system thinking idea, we want to determine what will be the ideal organization, what will be the, the ideal company, and what are the activities they will be deploying. Peter Checkland, the creator of the SSM methodology, um, recommends the use of two specific tools. The first one is called the root definition. The second one is conceptual models. Let me explain each one of them. As it is said there, the idea is to determine what the ideal world looks like. What is the ideal organization? What are the activities they need to perform in order to fulfill such a dream. When I mention a dream, probably you recall the interactive planning methodology, 
when you had a dream as a person that, that was your idealized design and then you compare the ideal with what you or where you will be the logical future if the comparison creates or is or through the comparison stage you are able to identify a gap that determines what are the activities you need to perform what is the gap you want to close and then you plan accordingly well a similar feature exists for the soft system methodology. No surprise, the, let me call it the area for action of the soft system methodology is not that different to interactive planning. If you recall, I said interactive planning area of application will be somewhere there. So that there's, there is a similarity between the benefits and where each one of those methodologies are used for. Remember, there is always room for disagreement between participants. Therefore, both tools, the root uh, definition and the conceptual models are often the product of a consensus exercise. When you build consensus by working with others, The root definition is a statement that must have a few elements. Those elements are associated with a mnemotechnic, uh, which is associated with the initial letter or the first letter for six different categories. Customers, actors, transformation, let me skip the W, then owner and environment. The W refers to a word uh, I understand in German language all of those who speak lang uh, German language will be able to say it in the right way but according to Peter Checkland there is no word in English language that express this worldview and according to him the word in German Weltanschauung is the one that express better what this cosmovision refers to, this um, orientation, this um, uh, perspective that you give to things. And according to him, Weltanschauung explains this better. So in order to illustrate um, what the root definition will be like, let me take the case of a jail, right? a, a, a prison. In a prison, who are the customers? And the customer definition says customers are all of those who are or could become the beneficiaries or the victims of the actions done by the system. If the system is the, penit the penitentiary system or a prison, the beneficiary will be society at large. At the end of the day, we create prisons in order to cast away, in order to move those elements of society who demonstrate they cannot live within the accepted norms or laws. So there is a benefit for society. Also, the society benefits because in theory, through that process, we allow people to adapt back to society after they go through a process, it, a personal transformation process. Of course, the victims, if you want, of course, in inverted commas, of the, of the jail system will be all the criminals. Those are the ones who suffer from imprisonment. Therefore, in this case, criminals are the recipients of the action and therefore they are also considered to be the customers of the system. The actors, of course, are all of those who enact, who are part of the process. In this case, you will have the judiciary system, the police, the uh, jail director, all the people, the jail guards, all the people who act or who are in charge of enacting the process of incarceration for those who are found to be guilty. The T, that's the transformation. And the transformation is relatively simple. 
In terms of transformation, always think. In terms of inputs, a transformation and an output. The input is a person. We don't incarcerate animals or anything else. It has to be a person. A person who did something wrong. They go through a process and eventually they come out of jail in order to go back to society. So that is the transformation process. The Weltanschauung probably will be explained better by showing you what's come next. But for some people, a jail is a, um, a place where we regenerate criminals. We have people who made a mistake for whatever the reason, so we're giving them the chance. First, we take that person away from society, and once in jail, they have the, time, the chance to recover, to understand what they, that, uh, what they did was wrong, and allow them to come back in society, to be able to live back in society by respecting all those principles we all share. However, for more often than not, particularly in certain parts of the world, a jail is a university for crime. In, unfortunately, in some cases, criminals, uh, petty criminals, uh, pickpocketers, uh, people doing a small fraud, they go to jail and this is where they learn how to become a big criminal. They pay their time, they serve their time, eventually they come out of jail and they come out of jail being a worse person than what they were before. Unfortunately, that happens. The Weltanschauung explains that the process is exactly the same. You have a criminal, you do that person out of society, they serve time and eventually they come back to society. The criminal could be a better person or a worse person. If you want the jail system to make sure all those criminals come out of jail being a better person, then you need to enforce, you need to make sure there are certain activities occurring while they are in jail. You have to help them, you have to provide counseling, you have to do so many activities with those inmates in order to allow them to become a better person. In some cases, it might not be possible, but at least as a society, we want jails to be a center where they, or when we try to regenerate, if you allow me the expression, to regenerate people so that they can join society back. Unfortunately, that is not always the case, right? So the Weltanschauung will be the, um, if you want, what will be the, the justification, what will be the perspective, what, what, what is that we want that jail to produce? And probably the examples I'm mean, having will help will be helpful in explaining this concept of a belt and shell. The owner, of course, is society. Uh, we pay with we we pay taxes, and uh, with taxes, governments create those jails. And of course, inmates they don't have to pay anything. In a sense, we as a society made the decision to pay for all the living expenses if you want. Well, they are in jail because we hope this will be a way for them to understand that they need to act in a different way if they want to be part of society. And the E is associated with environment. Of, uh, what I define is, in a, in a, for the case of a jail, the context of the specific nation will be important. There are societies, nations, where there are law-abiding societies. There are other societies which are a bit more lax in terms of the way they enforce uh, law. So the context plays a role, and that's where it's important to define. Out of those six elements, there are two that are essential. Those are the transformation and the Weltanschauung. That is explained again, uh, trying to provide a, a little bit more elements. And uh, I want to highlight the concept or the uh, idea of the Weltanschauung, the worldview. It refers to what view of the world makes the definition meaningful? We don't have 
jails just to cast away unfit persons, unfit people from society. This is supposed to be a center where we help people to regenerate. But you could have both. You could have a prison where it's just a center where you place those who do not fit in society. And that's it. They serve their time, 20 years, six months, whatever. And once they serve their time, they come back to society. They might be better, they might be worse, we don't know. It all depends or it changes from one individual to the next. It's just a jail. However, if the Beltanshaun is a center to help people, of course, there are additional activities you'll be doing as a jail if you really want to help people. So let me highlight those two elements. The transformation process. It refers to what is the core process at work in the idealized system and what is it doing? What is the system about? So the transformation process is whatever activities are required to move from the input to an output. And uh, it is quite important what is highlighted there. The transformation of the input into an output is such that parts or most of the input is present in the output. It could be a transformation process from uh, oil into gasoline. Gasoline is not oil. There is a refinement process. But at the end of the day, most of the characteristics of oil are present in gasoline. When you transform a piece of wood into furniture, clearly furniture is not the same as the wood. There are some additional elements. But most of the elements of the wood are in the piece of furniture that you are selling or, by, uh, or transforming wood into. The second element, this belt and shown, is what is the purpose in the system? Do we want only to jail people because they don't behave and that's it? Or do we want people to have the opportunity to reflect back on what they did wrong when we offer counseling activities, when we offer the opportunity for them to flourish, do they to realize uh, that they are not bad, bad people? Sometimes criminals, you and me know, are the result of the environment they live in. There are many factors associated with why a, a simple person, a good child, becomes a criminal. So probably if you give that person or those people the opportunity to reflect on all things that went wrong throughout their lives, they, are, they have the chance to come clean if you want. Maybe too idealistic, but certainly the purpose of a jail must be the one I'm describing late. It is not just a place where you send people you don't want in society and that's it. Because remember, as uh, this concept of fairness, I, I really like this idea of justice, in terms of John Rawls, who say, design all the mechanisms and all the uh, structures in society so that you don't know who is going to be where. Design a prison as if it's going to be the place where you will end up if you do something wrong. So if I do something wrong, I would love to have the opportunity to at least given the chance of reflecting on what I did wrong. I have the chance to come back to society, not just, just, not just a place for punishment. So there is a difference between the purpose of a jail as a center for punishment and, and a jail as a center for regenerating people. In this diagram, what I'm trying to explain, that, that arrow is uh, not perfectly placed, uh, the first one describes a system to temporarily segregate from society 
those who broke the law with the aim of rehabilitating those individuals so that they can rejoin society and live as law-abiding citizens. There is a couple of mistakes in the way I uh, wrote uh, that specific phrase, but I'm pretty sure if you go through that one, you will clearly identify that I'm referring to a jail. It is a system where we put people who broke the law temporarily, right? Of course, in some extreme cases, it could be life sentence, but in most cases, it's just for a period of time. And uh, the bit in red that highlights the importance of giving these individuals a second chance. Now, let me have another definition. It says the part in black is exactly the same. A system to temporarily segregate from society those who broke the law. That's it. That's a jail. In everybody's definition, that will be a jail. But in this case, it says operating at the lowest possible cost to society. If you want to fulfill this second definition, I don't know if we will be given, given enough food to inmates. In the upper definition, it is clear we need to do far much more than just taking people into prison. In the second one, it's just take people out of society, put them in prison, wait for the time, and that's it. So in graphical terms, I'd like to explain it in this way. That society, or that's supposed to be society, and we identify an individual who broke the law. Eventually, after the trial process, they declare the judges, the people who are part of the uh, panel evaluating whether a person is guilty or not, and they come with a guilty verdict, and that person goes to jail. Under the second definition, the process is exactly the same. There's a society, there's an individual who broke the law, he goes through a trial process and ends in jail. The process is exactly the same. So far, those activities are the same in the upper definition uh, or in the lower one. However, in the first one, you do expect to have many activities that allow the individual to go through a rehabilitation process where he's able to speak his mind, to talk about his fears, to talk about the motivation he had in order to break the law, and eventually help that individual and move from an individual being in jail to an individual who can go back to society and reintegrate to society as a law-abiding citizen. That activity is vital. That counseling, support, uh, psychological treatment, whatever. Under the second definition, the initial process is the same. To identify the criminal, he goes to trial, he's guilty, goes to jail. I'm fulfilling the transformation process. Eventually, the person comes out of jail. But the belt and shine is at the lowest possible cost. If it is at the lowest possible cost, there are no other activities. The most likely scenario, the person going back to society will be exactly the same thief with a few more years. So I hope this helps to illustrate what is the importance of the belt and shown, the purpose in the system. That's why we're just trying to determine what the ideal system is like, be clear about what is the transformation and what is the purpose in a system. It is clear most corporations exist to make money. So making money is the belt and shown. Of course, they transform inputs into outputs. That is the transformation process. And they do so in order to be a profitable business. If on top of looking for profits, you want to create jobs that are fulfilling to your workers, that is part of the belt and shown. You could have a business where you don't care about your employees. 
the transformation process is exactly the same. But the belt and chain helps in order to determine what is the purpose of the, of the business. It is about making money, but also acting as a device that society uses in order to create significant and relevant jobs for members of society. The fourth stage is the conceptual model. The conceptual model is the set, the group of activities that are required in order to fulfill the definition. Remember, in stage number three, I need to go back a bit, you have the root definition, what the system is about. Once you know the what, then you need to determine what is the how. The conceptual model has all those activities required to fulfill the definition. Of course, I don't expect you to see in detail that diagram. What I have now is I want to highlight first an element. Well, let me go forward and then come back again. So let's say I'm trying to fulfill the definition made about a jail aimed at helping individuals who broke the law for whatever the reason. So that is the conceptual model I created. It might not be perfect, but this is just to give you an indication what the conceptual model is like. So I thought in terms of what is do I need to do in order to fulfill the previous definition. According to me, first of all, there has to be a sentence. This person is guilty. That is done outside of the jail. That is done by the judge. The judge says, or the jury determines a person is guilty, and that information comes to me. Once I have, I as, I, I as, as the jail, or being part of the jail, then I identify the individual and receive a convict criminal. As I want to give this individual the opportunity to redeem himself or herself and go back to society, it would be important to evaluate the inmate's physical and psychological condition. It might, it might be the case that the person has a problem, a, a, a physical problem or a disadvantage that, are, that makes him to act in a particular manner. So that's why it is important to identify who is exactly the person I'm receiving. Once I identified what his uh, physical and uh, psychological condition is, then I can determine what options I can offer to that person. I need to increase his self-esteem. I need to give him a chance to work, to produce, to identify that he's a, a person as important as anybody else. So psych psych people in charge of psychological advice uh, or providing that type of care, counsel, will be able to work with this specific individual. So once you provide those counseling services, those, all the help that that person needs, eventually you hopefully came to realize that person is fit to join society again. That is not always the case. In all cases, that person has to be incarcerated. This is not a spiritual uh, retirement stage. It is a prison and there are regulations and all regulations are enforced. This is not that you have an image that you ask uh, what he wants. No, they have to live under the specific conditions and uh, based on what exists for everybody. It is not an optional, right? He has to live under certain rules. So you have to incarcerate that person, but also look after the person, right? Once a person walks into jail, the, the state is responsible for his or her well-being. If things go right, uh, things go on the upper, well, the outside bound, if you want, of the diagram, eventually the person is fit to rejoin society. Again, things cannot be or cannot go necessarily as we want, 
and we only have uh, the option of waiting for people to serve their time. Whatever the conditions are, it may be the case that once it is identified as a person that is fit to join society, probably he might be or she might be allowed to go back to society. In some cases, even though the person has, uh, go, ha has gone through this process, still the person has to serve their time. Once they serve their time and, and hopefully is able to go back to society, eventually the person is released and goes back to society. So all the activities in the large circle all activities inside that large circle are the activities that the system needs to perform in order to fulfill the definition I had before. A system to temporarily segregate from society those who broke the law with the aim of rehabilitating those individuals so that they can rejoin society as law-abiding citizens. There are four activities, two of them in red color, two of them in kind of a green color. The red ones are activities that, that occur outside of the boundaries of the jail. The sentence, that is not something that occurs within the jail. It is done by somebody else, the jury, the judge, whatever. And also the standards that society demands for criminals to rejoin society, probably that is not determined inside the jail system. It will be determined by the home office or the secretary of state. There are different names for the uh, instance or the institution who determines what those criteria uh, will be like. The two, one, the two ingredients are two activities that I believe must be part of any system, any organization. This is an ideal strategy when you are asked to design a system, to design a, a, an organization, activities, uh, when you want to design uh, a new group or a new area within an organization. Of course, it's quite a, a harmful, a helpful a, a, um, tool when you want to evaluate the performance of an organization. This is why I will recommend that you always have those two activities. The first one evaluates the system's performance. At the governmental level, somebody needs, or a society as such, needs to evaluate what the prison system is like. If inmates are coming out of jail, being worse persons than what they were when they went into, there's something wrong. We need to take corrective action. It could be the government, it could be us as a society, or it could be the legal system itself. But those activities are vital. So every time you design a, a, activities, areas, um, new uh, parts of, of organization, please do always have those two activities. Evaluation of the system performance and taking corrective action. The fifth activity, the next step, is the comparison. You are going to compare ideal with real. That is associated with the fifth stage in the methodology. The conceptual model are all the activities that we should be doing ideally to fulfill what is defined in the root definition. The conceptual model are the activities. You can go into a finer detail. You can go deeper into that specific uh, conceptual model. I will explain that into a separate video when I ask you to do the fifth tutorial. Remember, for that activity, that occurs after what is termed still as the Eastern break. But I will be explaining that bit in detail later on. At this moment, let me just highlight the next three stages. The first one, activity number five, is the comparison between real and ideal. And in order to do so, Peter Checkland suggests the use of a table. 
But if you look carefully, I have there three specific words. A primary task, consensus, and multiple perspectives. As you saw, I had a conceptual model about the activities that a person needs to do. But let me highlight this element of consensus, this pluralistic nature. Please assume this is the conceptual model produced by a person, person A. This is the conceptual model produced by a second person and the conceptual model produced by a third person. In all three cases, all of them agree with my suggestion and they have the evaluation of the system's performance and taking corrective action. Those are the same activities. But for this person, the system needs to perform those activities. According to this person, these are the activities and the relationship between them. For the third person, those are the activities. So ideally, you should be having three different ambitions, three different ideas of what is that the system needs to do in order to fulfill the definition. So let's say you are person A, I am person C. So first of all, I ask you to do your model, to present me your model. Then somebody else comes to the fore and present his or her model. And finally, I'll show you what I did. And this is a learning process because probably I identified this activity is not something I had on my model. The model you just saw, but probably this activity was not in my model. And once you present your model, I say, okay, this is quite important. I miss on this one. If we want to fulfill this uh, definition of a jail being a center for rehabilitation of people, certainly that is a must, and I miss it. So I'm learning from others the understanding of the problem and their idea for the solution. So the idea is, eventually, you come to something like this. Looks a bit messy, probably it is. But what I have is, I have a first uh, circle where I have activities where we all agree those are essential if we want to fulfill their definition. Uh, on the third system, the one I present, remember in this example, I was in charge of this third diagram. And the three of us agree that in my model, the first and the second activities are essential. Probably you come to realize this one and the one over there are exactly the same as the two you had at some point in your diagrams. So we have activities when we all agree those activities are important. All activities within this green boundary is what we call the primary task. Nobody disagree. Those activities have to be done. There are other activities where some of us believe they are important to be performed. But there are some differences. Some people don't necessarily agree. Not everybody agrees that those are essential to fulfill the mission for the organization. So this second rim is what we call the consensus activities. Finally, or let me go a little bit more on this consensus. Probably say, okay, I don't agree on this B6 activity, but let's concede that one is important. So if you agree with me that this, uh, sorry, if I agree with you that this B6 activity is important, will you agree that C3 will be important as well? I said, well, probably I will not be given lots of resources to C3, but yeah, probably it is. We will be assigning resources to all these activities, which we all believe are basic, are essential to the nature of the system, that without any of these activities, the system will not fulfill its intended objectives. 
some of us might not necessarily agree on all of these activities. This will be, have a secondary role. If we have the resources, we might be able to fund those activities. And there are some activities where there is complete disagreement. Probably only the person who suggests that activity is the only one who actually thinks it is important. The idea is not to, to disregard ideas. Probably the right idea is only uh, sustained, or is only identified by a single person. This is not uh, something that is based on, uh, on who or what is most popular. The right activities are the ones that you really need. But there might be disagreement and saying, well, that's probably not as important. Probably we will do that one later on. And it is very simple. Once you identify what activities constitute the primary task, those are the activities you need to start assigning resources. And you need to make sure those activities are done in the right way. Eventually, you assign resources and make sure activities associated with the consensus are performed and are performed in the way you expect. Finally, you go for the multiple perspective activities. And uh, this uh, sixth activity, which is the one before the last, is the definition of what is considered to be feasible and desirable. Eventually, uh, Peter Checkland, on his first uh, introduction of the methodology, he came with those two ideas, actions and activities that are feasible and desirable. Eventually, he came with the idea that the actions have to be resource feasible and society desirable. Adding those two elements, it has to be feasible in terms of the resources and desirable for society. Talking about or incorporating elements associated with environmental concerns. There might be a, a actions, activities that are important for an organization, but they might produce a, uh, waste or could be destroying the environment. And, and although it is feasible, it is not societal, uh, desirable at the society level. So this table is aimed at doing the sixth and the seventh activity. So what I did is I placed there all the primary task activities. The first question is, does the activity exist? The answer could be yes or no. If the answer is no, well, you have a clear path of action. Then you need to start working on the actual implementation of those activities. You need to determine uh, who's responsible for the activity, what are the resources that they're going to use, how they're going to measure performance. This is when you can incorporate some elements of the interactive planning methodology. Let me go back to this one. If you remember, in the interactive planning methodology, which you have been using in order to plan for yourselves, you have the resource planning and the implementation and control. These two activities can be used, uh, can be, yeah, be part of the SSM methodology. You identify what are the resources required, who's going to be responsible, what are the measures of performance. If some of the resources are not currently available, what is that you need to do? If there is something wrong, you go back to the drawing board. Probably you were aiming too high. You need to redefine and or probably the definition was too optimistic. You were shooting for the stars and probably it's not attainable at the moment. Probably you need to go back and say, okay, this, is a, this activity is not attainable in the short term. You go for something else, right? You go to the next activity. And the table is aimed at identifying what are the activities that are missing and those who actually exist, are they performing the right way who's responsible. And then you can identify and go back and ask yourself if the communications, apologies, if the communication exists. Remember, we have a strategy, a methodology aimed at implementing communication and control, the viable system model. What if you have these activities, the activities I got here, 
some activities are associated with the coordination control intelligence audit well actually audit, audit will be somewhere there so some of the systems associated with the viable system model could be the activities you're using to determine what are the activities that the system needs to do in order to fulfill the definition so what I'm, what I'm doing here I hope I'm not creating more confusion is I'm trying to bring together these different methodologies you can use them in a complementary way once you determine that an activity is being done you evaluate who's responsible for the activity and what areas of improvement can be suggested. And this is the soft system methodology. The seventh stage is not the end of the soft system methodology. Once you finish the implementation stage, you go back to the drawing board. And going back to the drawing board means you go back to the second stage. You have gone through a learning process. You've been implementing changes. Now go back and do the rich picture again. See if there is improvement for the situation you had to the new situation you are in. See if there is improvement. See if some of the barriers identified before have been removed. If those communication channels that were broken, are they where they are supposed to be? Is the online teaching better? compared to what it was before. So remember guys, the idea for these system methodologies is to have a strategy in order to go through a process of increasing your understanding of a situation. If the situation, if the problem is clearly defined, forget about system thinking. When you have a clear definition of what the problem is, everybody agrees what the problem is, forget about system thinking. That is not your best bet. System thinking is an adequate option if there is disagreement or you don't have all the elements to determine what the problem is. If everybody agree on what the problem is or what the solution is, the environment is relatively static. You are somewhere here. You don't have really system methodologies, system strategies. Most of them are useful when you know what you want, but you are in a dynamic environment. System dynamics is a good tool. These diagrams that we use, the software that we were meant to use helps in order to increase your understanding. Remember, we say we have two types of problems. We said structure problems, or define problems, then you are looking for the optimum level to optimize. When the problem is unstructured or ill structure, this, this is when you need to learn. Once you learn what the problem is, you are moving this situation from the ill structure situation to a defined one. Once you have what the problem is, proceed to solve it. Fire the manager, implement a total quality management, uh, change the production line, uh, create a training program, uh, expand the number of products that you got, change your channels of distribution, uh, lower the price. Then you have all the strategies and all the concepts that you know about management but once you need to determine what is the illness that the patient has a doctor who knows what the problem is he doesn't need to do any further analysis all diagnostic tools are set aside he uses medicines prescriptions when the doctor doesn't know what the problem is this is when he uses all the diagnostic tools in order to understand what the problem is. R the right diagnosis does not solve the problem.
The problem is solved by implementing specific actions, by taking the medicine. But when you have a patient and you are not clear what the problem is, you cannot be giving medicines and prescribing a particular diet or whatever if you are not clear what the problem is. Chances are the patient will die in the process. So you need to allow yourself the time to understand. Once you understand, you proceed to improve it. And all the, these diagnostic tools we've been covering during the semester, those are aimed at increasing your level of understanding. Once you understand, you proceed to optimize. This is what system thinking is about. So I hope this uh, clarifies a bit what is the aim of all the stuff we've been doing so far. We have next week the Eastern break. So in theory, we should be going home. Uh, as you know, we all are home these days. But please take the time to relax a bit if you can. It's always important. Uh, if you have, again, any concerns, any doubts, any questions, please get in touch with me. Otherwise, enjoy the Eastern break. And once we return from the Easter break, I will assign you, I will tell you what is the task for the fifth tutorial. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, as always, keep safe and stay home.